Learning about security doesn't need to be scary. If you want to ship code securely with confidence, check out the URL below and challenge yourself with thousands of challenges in 29 coding frameworks. Let the games begin. All right, so now we have Tanya. <laughs> I didn't actually prepare an introduction for Tanya because <laughs> she's been here a few days. Um, all the way from the great land of Canada. Canada, I love it. <laughs> Take it away, please. Thank you. Hi, everyone. How's it going? <laughs> Hi, I'm Tanya Jenka, and I'm going to talk to you about what DevSecOps is, and it has a lot to do with security changing the way we act. You are going to hear a strong Canadian accent. That is a bit like an American accent, except when I say about. Apparently, I say about, but I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> if I say something and you don't get it, it's an expression. I'll try really hard not to do that, but sometimes I do. And then I'll make self-deprecating jokes so that we're even. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, let's do this. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, so, first of all, who here writes code for their job? Awesome. Who here um, applies patches as part of their job? Okay. Uh, support, like tickets, all those things. Awesome. I have to do everything. <laughs> um, project management. Okay. People management. Who does security? Okay, so by the end of this talk, all of your hands are going to go up because security is everybody's job. Everyone's job. <laughs> Trust me. I'm going to explain, but don't worry. Okay, so what is this talk about? Thanks for coming. Thanks for the caffeine. <laughs> We're going to talk about DevOps. And in order to do DevOps, security needs to become a part of your everyday work. And then that's called DevSecOps. I'm going to explain in more detail. I usually do this at the beginning so people know if they're in the wrong room. If they're like, no, I don't believe in modernization and I want to do things and hang out with dinosaurs, um, then you would leave now, but don't, don't leave because it's only going to get better all day. OK, so who here has seen this slide? <laughs> ah, that is how some people view DevOps, but not me. This is how I view DevOps. It is us, it is, it is us the security people, enabling the developers, giving them tools, teaching them, helping them. They still poop magical rainbows, but we are helping them do it securely. That is how I see DevOps. OK, so now for the mandatory About Me slide. This is the one where we convince you I'm definitely qualified to give my own talk. So um, I love punk rock, and I'm Tanya Jenka, and I clean up pretty well. Um, on the internet, I'm called GX Purple. Yes, my hair is purple, because uh, I'm a purple teamer. Um, I just started my own company, and we're called Security Sidekick, and that's awesome. <laughs> Um, I am totally obsessed with OWASP, and you hopefully are going to love OWASP by the end of this day and come to all the Melbourne OWASP meetings from now on. Um, I started a little group called WOSEC, Women of Security, and we have a bunch of locations all over, but we don't have one here, but it's super fun. And I'm one of the people that started the OWASP DevSlop project, like sloppy DevOps. It's a place where I wanted to learn how to... How as an AppSec person I fit into security? So some friends and I started a project and decided we would live stream our mistakes. I mean learning. Anyway, that's me. OK, so I'm going to give you some brief introductions as to what each thing is. I know that you're at an AppSec conference, so some of you are already experts at this. But if you could see the demographic of the entire room, you would know there's like a bunch of students here, there's a bunch of people in other areas of IT that are interested in security. I want to make sure everyone understands the entire talk. So if you're like, I already know this, that's okay, just like snooze out for like a minute and a half till it's over. It's not going to hurt. Okay, so what is AppSec or application security? Um, so this is my definition. Anything you do to make your apps 
more secure is AppSec. So if you have hired a pen tester or someone to come and review your source code for security vulnerabilities, you are doing AppSec. If you figured out, oh, there's this old function, and after we did some tests, it turns out it's really vulnerable, so we're gonna grab through all our source code, find it, and replace it with the new one, that is AppSec. If you upgrade your you know, JavaScript front-end framework, because it turns out there's this mega vulnerability and it's being exploited in the wild, you're doing AppSec. All of those things are part of application security. Okay, why is AppSec important? Um, so insecure software is a huge problem. We are, unfortunately, the number one cause of breaches in the wild for the past three years. So basically since they've been counting, it's insecure software that's causing all of those bad things. And part of the problem is because it's not really being covered in schools. Like when, so I went to school a little while ago. <clears throat> uh, maybe like 20 years ago. But as I speak to people now, they're still teaching software developers how to make really cool software, and there's only cursory security topics generally. Another problem that I see that some of you might be unaware of is that security is outnumbered. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have seen this, but they say there's one security person for every 100 developers and every 10 operations folks. However, I don't believe I've ever had odds this good, right? Like, who wants to be me trying to wrangle or work with or persuade, beg, 110 other people to do the scare thing I want them to do, right? Okay, last thing on this. Um, so who here has been subjected to waterfall system development lifecycle before? Yeah. Under waterfall, around 70% of projects fail. So we've learned from this and we've improved. Well, the security model for waterfall was just, oh, it's so bad. So we're going to talk about how we can do things differently and improve. Yes. Okay. So what is DevSecOps? Right? So um, my friend Imran says... It is performing application security in a DevOps environment. So how do I fit in as an AppSec engineer into a DevOps environment? Because I have to change. I can't say, oh, I'm gonna do a three week code review. Could you just like all stop? No, <laughs> no one's gonna stop for me. We have to adjust ourselves to fit in. Some other people say, uh, that you shouldn't say DevSecOps and that you should say DevOps because DevOps done properly includes security. And I promise all of you, the moment that all the DevOps shops create secure software every time, I'll shut up. But until then, I feel like we need to keep making a fuss, unfortunately. Okay, so what is DevOps? Who here um, has read the DevOps handbook? Okay, so I'm gonna give the DevOps handbook definition. I'm not gonna give um, some of the other industry definitions because they're kind of wishy-washy and it's hard for me to actually tell what the hell they're talking about and I don't know how to go do it after, right? So first I'm gonna talk about the main goals, then I'm gonna talk about how you do it, then I'm gonna talk about how we as security professionals weave ourselves through it in a wonderful way. So the main goals of DevOps are improved deployment frequency so we want shortened lead time between our fixes. So no more waterfall where you wait a whole year to release stuff. I want to release stuff more often so there's less risk. I want lower failure rates. Oh my gosh, I don't want things breaking all the time. <laughs> um, and I want a faster time to market. So I want to be ahead of the competition. And if you're doing waterfall, you don't, like, if it takes a whole year to get a release out or eight months or, or whatever it is, like, you are not beating the competition generally. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you why each one of these things is actually in line with what the security people want. So employed, de uh, improved deployment frequency means you can fix the security bug I found right now. <laughs> Um, I don't want to work at a place where an emergency is 16 months or four months to get a release, right? Like, I, I don't know how many of you have worked in a place where you're having a huge incident, and if a developer says to you, like, oh, an emergency release will take months and months and months, like, you just want to pull your hair out, run away, and cry. So DevOps is just so magical. It's like, we found this really awful thing. Don't worry. In an hour, it'll be fixed. Yes. Um, so the next thing would be lower failure rates. So a lot of people call it resiliency. 
when security, we call it something else. So who here has seen this before, the CIA triad? This is the reason why security people get paid. And if you look at resiliency, it's availability. It's the same thing. So DevOps people want all their apps to be up all the time. They want lower failure rates. They want their apps to be rugged and tough and resilient. Yes, I want that too. So the last thing is the faster time to market. A lot of people are like, that has nothing to do with security. But guess who pays my paychecks? The business. And if the business doesn't get out to market and isn't competitive and doesn't win, I don't win either. There is no security team if there is no business. If we are getting in the way of the business getting their work done effectively, we are the threat, not all of the other threats, right? So security doesn't win if the business doesn't also win. So now, in my opinion, we feel as security people we're in line with the goals of DevOps, so what do we do? Oh yes, uh, I said this too. I feel like if other people would just say the thing I wanted, I could quote them, but <laughs> DevOps is the best thing to happen to application security since OWASP, and I have had a multi-year love affair with OWASP as a community. Um, I've run my own chapter in my own project. I've met like so many of my friends through OWASP and amazing people that I've gone to work with. So me saying that, oh, it's even better, like that's a huge compliment from me. Okay, so now let's talk about what the three ways are of DevOps. If we were in a smaller room, I would try to get someone to guess them, but I'm not going to be painful with you. However, okay, no. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm, just, I'm gonna stay on track with my time. Okay, so the three main ways of DevOps to know you're doing DevOps. A lot of people are like, oh, we have a pipeline, we're doing DevOps. No. So there's three ways, and a pipeline can be part of one of them. So the first way is emphasizing the efficiency of the entire system. So if I work really, really hard to speed up my part, but there's still this other blocker, so it still takes just as long for everything, essentially I've wasted my time. It would be smarter if I went and met with another team and helped them you know, get more efficiencies in their part so that we could move all of it forward. Right? So this is where pipelines often come in. Automate boring things. Right? So we can just have speed. So the next thing, the second way, is that we want to have feedback immediately. The main reason that Waterfall didn't work very well is because we would get feedback after like a year. I remember doing software development and I was making like mock-ups in the meeting with my clients and showing it to them and the director being like, what are you doing, Tanya? You can't show it to them. I'm like, but I want their opinion. I want to know I'm making what they really need. And he thought I was nuts, but it turns out um, that actually works really well, right? So you want to get feedback as soon as humanly possible. And then the third way is continuous learning. You need to keep learning and learning and learning and learning um, because otherwise you will be a dinosaur. You won't get the things done that you want. You won't be able to achieve the goals you want. And you won't be able to keep adding efficiencies and getting faster feedback if you keep doing things the same way. Okay, so now I'm going to explain a whole bunch of things that we can do in each one of the three ways. That's going to be the whole rest of the talk. I think I present like 28 different ideas. At the end of each section or midway through, there's going to be something I call the photo slide. I believe this talk has seven. So you can just listen to me. I'm going to have pictures of people, and you can just listen and absorb the information, and you can just take a picture after the photo slide. I already took all the notes for you, um, because I have learned that if there are words, I must read them. So I assume that some of you are like me, so don't stress out. Don't worry. And all these slides are already on the internet. Put them up last night. Ha <laughs> ha. OK, so let's emphasize the speed of the entire system. So left to right. So we're talking about speed. So if this is the system development lifecycle, we want to do this as soon and as often as possible. So what does this mean for dev and ops? It means we need their help. Um, so we need their help. If we're going to put security tools in their pipeline, we need permission, and we need them to help us tune it so that we don't break everything and make their pipeline take 18 hours instead of 18 minutes. 
Um, we need them to reuse code that they know is good. So if you are a consulting company and you make lots and lots of apps for different companies and they all have login screens, don't recreate the wheel every time. Reuse code that we've already tested quite well. Um, we want you to use up-to-date images. We want you to scan before you put stuff out into the world, right? If you're going to do a container or if you're going to do an image, you got to check, right? So we need them. We can't do all of that. We need them on board. Um, if we make a security pipeline, which I will explain later, we need them to actually use it. And we need you to make unit tests because I'm going to do awful things with them later in the talk. Okay, so here is a slide that you can take a picture of if you desire. I'm not going to give you that long to take the pictures because it's boring for everyone else that isn't doing that. Okay, next. So what else, so what does this mean for security? So this is a security conference, so I'm gonna talk about security the most. There's actually a lot more stuff that Evan Ops can do. I have a different talk, I have like a whole bunch of talks about that, but I'm gonna concentrate on the security side of this for now. So we need to emphasize the speed of the entire system. We are never allowed being a bottleneck again, or it needs to be a really good reason. I have, oh, I have waited on so many security people. I was a software developer for 17 years before I switched to security. I'm a lot older than I look, apparently. I don't know, they freeze me for six months a year in Canada. Um, <laughs> all of us, just like little popsicles. Um, but yeah, like we can't just make everyone wait all the time. That's like the number one takeaway here. But also, um, so if, Dev and ops are doing sprints and they're doing agile. We need to do sprints too. We need to break our work into chunks like they are so that we can get things done. And if we play our cards right, we can get a security sprint where all they do is security activities. But that can't happen if we don't play it long. Um, oh yes, there we go. There were more clicks. Okay, next. So another thing that we can do um, besides breaking things into smaller activities is we need to make sure that we tune every single tool that we subject dev or ops to. So again, I was a software developer, and they would run like these crappy VA tools. So there are awesome VA tools, and there are not awesome ones. And if they're producing false positives and your security team isn't weeding those out for you and like looking into them and doing their absolute best to reduce that. They all seem crappy to the software developers. So we need to cause them less pain. We need to cause the ops people less pain. So tuning tools is absolutely really important. And whenever possible, if we can create a template for them. So for instance, um, so I used to work for Microsoft and they have like this DevOps tool, like pipeline thing, it's really cool. And um, I would subject all of my colleagues to my security-ness all the time. They're like, we're just making demos. And I would just like always be in their face about security. And I'm like, I'm gonna make this template. And so every single new pipeline that one of you creates is gonna have like these checks in it automatically. Like, yeah, score. And um, they still liked me anyway, which is good. Good. But the point is, is like you can template your pipeline, you can template um, like login screens. There are so many things that you can do to assist developers and ops people. So it's like just less painful and less time for them. But it only works if you get on board. Okay, so this is another photo slide. Dun dun. Um, another thing, the last thing on the screen I'm going to talk about is a secure coding library. Um, so I've worked at a lot of places where, I mean, if you're creating code and and tools are just internal, it's different, but if you're creating as a service for other places, you often redo the same types of work. And if you're gonna reuse code, I suggest making a secure code library section in your code library, but don't just go into the developer's library and start touching stuff. That's not cool, it's like a woman's purse. You ask permission. You definitely don't wanna just like go in there and mess with things, because no one will be your friend anymore. Okay, so what else does this mean? for the security team. So I'm a big proponent of if you're going to have like a pipeline and the developers are like, our pipeline takes eight minutes. It's very sure, it's very fast. You could do a quick check or two in there, but if you want to do something like SAS, like static application security testing or static code analysis, or there's like lists and lists of more in-depth things that take a really long time to do, that if you try to put in their pipeline, not invited to parties anymore. 
Um, <laughs> it sounds like it sounds silly, but like if you, as the security person, are invited to the lunches with Dev or Ops, like you are going to do so good at your job, <laughs> not because like you're popular and cool, but because they respect you enough to bring you along. And um, so I like joke, oh, you're not going to be invited to parties anymore, but it's true. Like <laughs> if you get invited to like their party, like you have really scored as like an AppSec person, like you are doing great. <laughs> okay, but so to get back on topic, um, I like to try to make another pipeline that is asynchronous. So when I ask them, like, oh, on Fridays, could you just, like, kick that off for me? And it'll just run 48 hours. Who cares? Because it's not going to prod. It's just going out into nowhere and just running every single one of my tools that I want. It's not stopping them from doing their work. Like, my goal as an AppSec person is to help and enable and never um, disable, never block, and hopefully, if I'm really careful, I'm really lucky, not annoy, right? Like, I want the developers to be like, yay, she's coming to help us, not like, oh, where can we hide? Jeez, oh, security team's coming. Um, and the last thing on this slide, oh, I have a whole bunch of things, actually, but the last thing on this slide is that give if we give security tools to ops and to developers, they might actually use them, especially if we train them how to do it safely. I've learned that a lot of them want to, they want to learn and they're curious about security. And if you can afford to buy licenses for them, I know some tools are quite expensive, but there's actually like a lot of things that are cheaper or free. Like from OWASP, there's OWASP Zap, it's free, right? So giving them tools with training in a safe place to run them, it can be really advantageous and you can get them to do like half your job. Yes. Okay, so more. Um, you can write your own code libraries. Um, places like Netflix, um, I believe Airbnb is here and they're gonna give a talk about a bunch of things, but you can create your own AppSec tools for your company if you have very specific niche needs. Um, so I, I used to live in Ottawa in Canada and now I live on the other side of the country, which is really quite far. But in Ottawa, they have this giant Shopify shop, and they would host my OWASP chapter, and the AppSec team would always come and hang out with us. They're really cool. And um, uh, they... They write in Ruby, so they actually, you know, they kept like writing fixes for things, so they actually just started patching the entire Ruby framework for everyone, and they are actually the biggest contributor to the Ruby project now, like hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of like work and fixes and time that they spend. They're like, well, let's just make it secure for everyone. I'm like, oh, yes. Anyway, I'm off topic. I'm sorry. I just like really like those people. Okay. Um, but basically, the long story short of this slide is do anything you can to enable them to do their job securely. That's what our job is as the security team. It's our job to help everyone get whatever they're trying to do done securely. That's it. Okay, so here is number three. And then we're going to go on to the next way of DevOps. So the next way is faster feedback. So I'm going to show you some more amazing animations. Okay, so faster feedback. Like this. Some might say it's pushing left. <laughs> we, want to we want feedback right away. We want feedback the moment we can get feedback, right? And if that means, you know, during the requirements phase, having a security person say, oh crap, but if we're gonna do like file uploads, you know, that's pretty risky business in regards to security, so like, what are we gonna do about that? Maybe we should add some requirements around that, right? It's the same with dev and ops. You don't wanna find out like after you've released the image, oh, by the way, it has, like that's a really old version, there's no patches on it. That sucks. It's the same way, it's the same way for security. So. I like to use money to convince management to do what I want. Well, now I guess I am management, but up until three weeks ago, I was not. Um, I believe my title is Minion. No, just kidding. Um, but so the earlier you fix a bug, the cheaper and the easier it's going to be to fix the bug. So like, if we look, I don't know if these numbers are exact. 
It doesn't matter if it's 80 or if it's $90 during like the dev phase. But the later you fix things, and the thing that's not on the screen, so it's like, oh, in production, that's if you find the bug. But if a malicious actor finds that bug, and then you have to call an incident responder to come in and fix it in the middle of the night, and then you end up doing like cleanup for weeks, that number's way higher, right? So when you explain to them, like, if you will just let me, you know, do some application security, <laughs> I can, I can make your life better and your budget lot smaller. Um, I worked at a place and I did all the math and I proved to them it would cost less to have an AppSec program. And then all the executives were like, oh, we're in. Save us money, let's do it. I'm just like, yes. Okay, keep going, Tanya. Don't get so off topic. Okay, so the next thing is for feedback, um, I want feedback both ways. Oh, wait, wait, this is not the slide I thought it was. Wait, wait, let's go back. I want to hear from the dev team and the ops team if I've done something that ticks them off. Even like if I don't want to hear it, I, like, I don't like it, I want and need to hear it. Um, I have uh, this friend, Travis McPeak, who's totally awesome, and he works at Netflix on the AppSec team, and he was telling this amazing story about how they released this thing called Repo Man, and it would take away all the extra permissions, and they were trying to do something called least privilege, because they're like, oh, we're giving everything so many permissions, all these services like have superpowers, and they're taking things, and they broke everything. And so the developers were like, that is not cool. You are messing up our stuff. This is not acceptable. So they took away Repo Man, and then they came up with Repo Kid. <laughs> and Repo Kid would just watch. So a new service would go out with the default amount, and it'd be like, mm, you haven't used this permission. Let's see if we can, OK, you don't need that. And slowly, they repealed something ridiculous, like 70% of all the permissions in their whole company. It was wild how well it worked. But they would never have gotten in there if they hadn't listened, right? So I feel like that's a great example. So the next thing is, yeah, the security team listening and taking action. But another thing is, is that we can invite dev and ops into our home of the security team. So if there's an incident, this is how I got involved in managing incidents. They're like, hey, do you want to sit in? Actually, I begged and pleaded, and then eventually they gave in. But let's pretend they invited me. <laughs> and then in the meeting, I was like, that's code, and I can read it. It's obfuscated. I know what's happening here. And then all of a sudden, I was on the incident response team, and I was so excited. And then eventually, I was on the security team. right? And so if you invite them into your activities, you can potentially attract them to your team. And trust me, that is very valuable. OK. Oh, actually, there's one more thing that I want to say first. If you put some security checks in the pipeline, they're for serious things, right? They're for things that you're really worried about. They have to break the build. You should only break the build if you really need to, but they have to break the build. It is not a popular move, I know. <laughs> Um, but this is, it's like a culture change that you're slowly going to have to work up to. No one wants to be that person that broke the build. However, if you don't do it for real serious security issues, that means badness. OK, so next slide. So what does this mean for security? It means pushing left. Yes. Right? It means we get faster feedback loops. We get information a lot more quickly. And that means we need to provide feedback more often and more widely. I've seen a lot of places where um, they, will, oh, they will do a pen test, and this one team will get the results. And they're like, oh, well, it's secret. And I'm like, I know, but if it turns out like we, none of us are using security headers on this team, they're probably not using it on every team. And maybe we should like tell everyone, hey, maybe we should use those, right? You can take those results and do all sorts of things with them. But if we're keeping secrets all the time, it doesn't work. So we need to provide feedback. And sometimes the feedback is good feedback, but we'll get to that. OK, so other things. Oh, wait, no, sorry, buttons. Um, I already told you this story about the repo kid. But I can't stress enough listening. I've had so many different examples, but because it'll be really clear where I was working, I'm not going to share them. <laughs> Um, but if you don't listen to developers, if you don't listen to the ops folks, they're definitely going to stop listening to you. And that's the key part of this, of what security needs to do, is we need to listen, we need to react, and then we need to provide feedback to them as well, good and bad. OK, here we go. Oh, yeah, I took out a slide here. You can rename functions. 
that your team uses that are insecure that you don't want them using anymore with wrappers, depending upon the IDE that you're using. So I worked for Microsoft. So guess what? I love .NET. And um, so in .NET, like, you can add wrappers to things so that when they're actually coding, it will like change and say, like, this is the insecure version. Do you want to use the secure version? There's a bunch of tools now that you can buy where it'll plug into your IDE and tell you things are wrong and give you feedback instantaneously. It doesn't matter how you get the feedback to them. It just matters that you do it, and you do it as quickly as you can. OK, next. So what else does this mean for security? So one thing that I am really into lately, so a lot of developers create something called unit tests. And it tests a really small part of the code to make sure it does what it's supposed to do. But a thing you can do is test that it doesn't do what it shouldn't do. So you can make a negative unit test. You can put something called a payload, which is a bunch of code that is harmful, that's bad, and you can make sure that your code fails gracefully. Another thing you can do is you can take that pen test result from your other app, or from the app that you did test, and you can make unit tests out of that, but you can also take those things and you can apply it to unit tests and other apps. Like, I've worked at places where we have you know, 27 apps, but we can afford exactly one pen test. <laughs> all year. <laughs> and so I would take that, and I'm like, well, the same developers wrote all this other code, so let's look at this list of the things they found wrong, and let's look at the other apps, and I would find like 75% of the same things wrong and all the other things. And if you can automate that and turn that into unit tests, it's painstaking, it takes a lot of time, but then you have regressive security testing with every check-in, and that's kind of amazing. Okay, that is it. And for this one, Again, I want to stress that if we expect to be invited to meetings for dev, and we expect to be invited into important meetings for ops, we need to invite them to meetings if it's not a secret. So I know a lot of things are secrets, but sometimes they're actually not that secret. Like, I used to work somewhere, and we were doing anti-terrorism things. And obviously, I'm not going to tell you about it. But oh my gosh, like this one person would just mark every single thing top secret. I'm like, dude. It's not all top secret, like where we had lunch. I'm sorry, it's just like no one cares. <laughs> um, and we, if we can share more information, if we can allow them to participate in things like incidents, definitely threat modeling, definitely have, see if you can talk to the project manager and actually have a sprint amongst all the other sprints where we just do security things, et cetera. It's a giant, giant win. Okay, so what else does this mean? Um, it means that, so I'm a big fan of using metrics. I like to measure everything. Uh, and when I worked at Microsoft, that was really exciting because they're awesome at measuring stuff. <laughs> um, so if you can measure things, then you can tell how to improve on things, and you can do more experiments and then improve and improve and improve. So there are a bunch of cool tools on the market. I'm just going to tell you about the OWASP one because it's free, and it's called Defect Dojo. So there are a bunch of vulnerability management tools. So it'll suck up all the results of all of your things, and then it'll show you a bunch of pictures. And it will definitely show you, trust me, that no one seems to want to use all the security headers they should, and that everyone loves programming things that have cross-site scripting. So you can always start there, but there's usually like unique things to each place that I look at or consult at where I'm like, oh, it appears that there's like a big problem with this one specific thing. And it's not one person, it's often like a team or um, a lack of knowledge for whatever reason. And you can get huge wins if you look at metrics. But the developers and the ops people can only get those wins if you actually share those metrics back with them. Um, I, I worked at this place once, and they had this golden image, and they gave it to me. I'm like, this is like six weeks old. This is crap. I don't want this. I want something that's patched up until today if I'm going to release it today. And they're like, but that's our golden image. I'm like, I, it's, it's like made out of tin. It's not gold, trust me. Um, so anyway, feedback. OK. Next. Um, so this is the last photo slide in this section, and then we are going to switch to continuous learning. I'm going to tell you just a little story. So I did this talk at RSA last year, which was really exciting. Um, and uh, after, my friend went back to work, and she said there was someone in her office. So this person, this is a demonstration of why you need training. This person was like, that Tanya woman, she's so smart. She invented this thing called DevOps. 
<laughs> this person had not been on training or read anything in so long they'd never heard of DevOps before. And they're like, yeah, she's really smart. Seems like it's cool. Maybe we should try some DevOps. And my friend was just like, oh my god. And so this is just one of the reasons why we need to do continuous learning. And it doesn't mean paid training. There's many ways. Like where you are right now, you are doing learning. Well, I hope that you're learning. OK, so I don't have a cute little animation or whatever, but the idea is, is that it comes full circle. right? You'll be better at the other two things if you continue to learn, especially if you share information with your team. OK, so what does this mean for dev and ops? Please accept security training if you are offered it. That is so rare. So many places do not offer that. If they're going to offer it, please come. I used to work somewhere, and they're like, well, let's make the training mandatory. I'm like, no, instead, let's make the training cool. <laughs> let's make the training fun. Let's bribe them with donuts. Canadians like donuts and pizza. We really like pizza a lot. <laughs> I'm like, let's, let's bribe them with carbs and make the thing really cool and fun. But if we offer you training, please say yes. Um, you can also train yourself. So I'm going to share some resources at the end. I share tons of free resources. All the other speakers that are here, lots of them blog. They have other talks. So if you like someone's talk here, there's like all these people who I'm so excited to see them speak. If I like it, I'm going to go watch every other talk they've ever done. <laughs> um, so you can continue to train yourself. Um, a thing that I'm going to mention on this, I guess this is for the security team. So I'm just going to switch to the security team one. Um, I'm a big fan of running simulations of things that I'm concerned about. So I used to work at Elections Canada, and um, I was the CISO, not for the election that happened a week and a half ago, but for the one before that, where we voted in the guy with the great hair. And we ran a complete, total simulation of the entire election six months before. They do this every time. And they have for like 125 years, 150 years? Anyway. Um, and. We threw in incidents, and we were awful. And we built an entire station where you would go and vote. And then we brought in four different hackers to just smash the crap out of it. And then we learned about everything, fixed it, and then election day went very nicely. <laughs> you can do that with everything. You can do simulations. You can do a fake incident and run through it and see, oh, crap, I don't actually have access to those logs. Oh, that would really suck if it was 4 in the morning and I didn't have access to those logs. So. OK, I'm going to leave that there. OK, so what else does this mean for security? You can do all sorts of different continuous learning. So experimentation. A lot of people talk about rugged DevOps, right? Doing chaos engineering, so where you throw in monkey wrenches, essentially, ruin things to see how well you can react to them. I suggest you only do those things if you feel confident that you're going to not get fired after. Um, it's a more advanced activity, but I think it's definitely a very real, uh, worthwhile activity. And so from a security perspective, as opposed to chaos engineering for ops, you can do red teaming, which is a lot like chaos engineering, but for security people. Um, but it's our job, in my opinion, it's our job as security people to teach and enable everyone to do their jobs securely. And so if you are hiring a whole bunch of students fresh out of school and they don't know anything about security, it turns out that just yelling at them and shaming them all the time is not going to teach them any security. Yeah. Um, it turns out that if you, know, like you have like a senior developer who's really, really smart at all these things and then um, he made a mistake one day and then you just like give him shit and embarrass him, yeah, it turns out that doesn't help. Um, instead, <laughs> meeting with someone and being like, hey, I found this thing. Can we fix it together? We're or like, um, you know, oh, I read this really cool article. I think that it might help you with that problem we had last week. Like, if you don't mind, like, maybe you could check it out. I feel like helping people save face is a really good way to not only make friends, but actually get the thing you want done, which is continuous learning. OK, so this is the photo slide. And then I believe I have to like go faster because I only have a few minutes left. 10, OK. So I'm going to assume everyone got a photo of this, and I'm going to continue. Oh my gosh, there's more for security. So when you do a post-mortem, it's really important that it is blameless. You can't say, Alice did that, and Bob did this. This safeguard was missing. This process was broken. This is really important. I learned this the hard way because I yelled at someone. and then. Well, I didn't yell. It was like my version of yelling. I spoke sternly. It was great. We're Canadian. I did apologize after. But the point is, uh, that doesn't get you what you want in the end. If 
you're scared and you yell at people during an incident, it turns out that's not helpful. <laughs> um, teach developers and ops every opportunity you get if there's a mistake or if there's a win. It sounds weird, but like if a team did really well, what if we like teach everyone what they did really well? <laughs> Um, I also believe in knowledge bases. Uh, I used to lead a dev team for a really long time, and it was like, it was a dumpster fire. It was so bad. We were all these different acquired companies all mashed together, and no one had any documentation, and we started doing this little knowledge base, and everyone was like, this is a waste of time, blah, blah, blah. And then eight months later, instead of having seven or eight people constantly working tickets, we had one person working tickets. It was awesome. I only had to rotate once every 21 days. Yes. OK. And here is the last photo slide. So if a security test fails, I just want to remind everyone, you have to break the build. I know it's a big deal. No one likes it. I don't mean to always go over time. I'm just really I'm set to verbose mode. OK, next. OK. So. Security needs to become a part of DevOps, which means culture change. So we need to celebrate when we win. I'm not kidding. Donuts, pizza, high fives, all the things. An email recognizing a developer or an ops person because they made this great security save. Celebrating really helps. What if we work together? What if we spent time together? What if we're in the same building? What if sometimes the security person went and sat with the team while they worked on stuff? Being physical, close proximity, it actually helps. And if you work remotely, turn on your cameras. <laughs> turn on your cameras when you do a video call. Seeing someone and looking in their eyes is so different than just talking to a screen. Again, blameless postmortems. I cannot stress how important that it, this is because I have learned this the hard way. And then you can create security champions. Um, my friend Ray just released this really awesome blog article about how to basically create like an army of security champions that run out and do half your job for you and how great it is. <laughs> but if someone's really interested in security, I strongly suggest encouraging them as much as you can because that will come back tenfold to you. Maybe they'll even join your team. OK, so now I'm going to get awkward, because that's what I do. Um, so it is our job, as security people, to enable dev and ops to do their job securely. So we enable them, we teach them, we add automation, and we give them feedback. So I would like everyone to raise their right hand, because it turns out, no, for real, I, I have nine minutes I can stare at you awkwardly. Um, <laughs> He says, if you promise and you say it out loud, you may, I see you with your hands crossed and all the stuff. I'm coming later. And thank you. I appreciate that. I have like really good eyesight. OK, so I promise. It's weird. I couldn't, I don't know, I'm deaf or something. I don't know. OK, so one, two, three. I promise to enable dev and ops to do their jobs securely. Sorry as best I possibly can. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so now um, I'm going to give you some resources. And if you want to take out your cameras, you can. So the first thing I think you will want to do is join OWASP Melbourne. And if you're not from Melbourne, there's one in Sydney. They're all over the planet. I think we have 280, 290. We have so many. OWASP love is like a giant community you can join online of people who really care passionately about this. If you are a woman or identify at all as a woman, um, WOSEC would love to encourage you and help you make a ton of new friends. Because sometimes you just want to hang out with someone and talk about your your hair and security. Like, yeah, I smashed all those boxes, and then I, uh, I'm using this brand. What are you using? I, it sounds silly, but it's so true. Um, every Monday, I run something online on Twitter called Mentoring Monday. Who here has worked in their field two or more years? Congratulations. You know enough to do your job and mentor someone else so that one day they could have a job like yours. Not your exact job. <laughs> but there's someone out there that wishes that they could be a C++ developer, that they could do incident response, that they could be an AppSec engineer or a pen tester, or that they could you know, do ops in this more modern way that you're doing it that they wish that they knew. 
Um, I encourage all of you, if you're trying to get into a field, to use this hashtag on Monday. So I tweet, if you tag me, I'll retweet you to all my followers. I've connected hundreds and hundreds of people over the past year to other people. If you know lots, respond to someone, make their day. It can be as little as, hey, that's awesome you want to join AppSec. Have you checked out this yet? Or do you want to have a virtual coffee? Or maybe inviting them to a meetup that's in their city that they didn't know about. All of these things can lead to someone feeling welcome, joining our industry, and doing a way better job. <laughs> And lastly, resources, me. <laughs> um, you can follow me. <laughs> I create uh, videos and blogs and do this. That was not dancing. Um, <laughs> I do a lot of stuff, and all of it is free. And um, I started a company, and normally I wouldn't share this, but it is our plan to share all of the education we create instead of just with our customers, uh, with the public. So if our tool finds a bug, I'm going to make a video and a blog post and all of this, and instead of just charging for it. We're just going to give it away for free because it's really important to me to move our industry forward. And if we keep AppSec a secret, it's not going to happen. Okay, so what did we learn today? We learned security is a part of DevOps, and that means DevSecOps. Thank you all so much for being fabulous. Cheers. Thank you very much, Tanya. Can I have another round of applause for Tanya? Thanks. All righty. While we wrangle the next speakers, wherever they may be, um, do we have any questions? We have a few microphones floating around. So if there are any questions, if you can just raise your hand, I'll come running and get my steps up. Or you could yell it, and I will repeat it for the or audience. Or we could do that. If See, you want. I was thinking. See, normally I bring candies and I forgot them in my bag at my hotel and I didn't have time to go back and get them. They're maple candies and usually they work as great bribes. Well, you can give out hugs. Whoever wants a hug. Yeah, I've got, <laughs> I brought endless high fives. I'm very nice. Uh, are there any questions in the, in the audience? Well, not that I can, oh, sorry. It's very difficult to see. Ooh. Okay. You can also ask me after. Uh, you mentioned, hi. You mentioned you worked um, securing the Canadian election. Did you yeah. detect any attempts at attacks? So obviously I'm not telling you that. <laughs> no, I <don't. laughs> um, Yeah. That's a yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> we uh, ate a lot of pizza. Sometimes we stayed late. <laughs> Celebrating success, that's fantastic. <laughs> Are there any other questions in the audience, guys? Yeah, we were celebrating, that's what he said. That's what we're doing when we ate the pizza and stayed late. Oh, there's one <laughs> Over up there. Over there, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll just yell out. Oh, fantastic. Um, you mentioned celebrating security wins. Yes. Can you see what a security loss is because something bad happens? What is a security win? So you mentioned celebrating security wins give examples of security wins. Okay, so if you have a pen tester come in and they can't find anything worth a damn, that is a giant win. If you manage an incident smooth like butter, like my team once, I kid you not, we solved an incident in 14 minutes. It was awesome. It was like this, 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 that. And then ironically, the student's like, do you think that it could be? And then we're all just, and. The executives were like, Tanya, we want you upstairs like on the hour, and we want a progress report. And I come in, I'm like, oh yeah, we solved it. It's this. And they're just, oh, damn. And then I ran downstairs and just literally ran around my office high-fiving everyone, including the student. The student got double high-fives. Because, come on, 14 minutes, yes. Um, if, you, if you solve something later, so once there is an incident and I never figured out how the thing happened. We just never got there with our research. But six months later, I went to a conference and I learned a new investigation technique. And it clicked in my mind immediately. So even though I didn't work for them anymore, I still had like top secret clearance. So I held a meeting with them in a special room and I was like, I know what happened. And then I shared with them like what happened and then how they could prevent it in the future. And then again, celebration, high fives. Like it sucks that at the time we're like, okay, so this awful thing happened and we don't know exactly how it happened. We can trace it out. But then six months later, the fact that we finally did know what happened and we could prevent it from happening again, to me, that's a giant win. If you, 
Um, when I launched my very first AppSec program, they gave me zero dollars to start. They're like, the dollars we're giving you is your salary. So I taught everyone how to use Zap, and I had all these lunch and learns, and we made this thing. If you find these types of things in Zap, you have to fix them, because when it gets to me, if there are problems that Zap could have found, I'm going to make fun of you. That's your punishment. <laughs> and so um, developers started like scanning all their stuff, and they would tell me if they did well, right? And so I was talking to like this big boss one day, and then I, I get this message. I'm like, oh, just a second. And I like run across the floor, and we're like Office 2.0, which is really stupid. And so it's like it's in the open, and like he puts his hand up, and I'm like, bam, nice work. And then I like run back to my office, and I'm like, so please continue. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, AppSec. He just got no highs and no mediums. He got too low. He gets a high five on demand. High fives on demand is what I promised, right? And there's like, oh, and he, he was like, you're being ridiculous. I'm like, no, the developers love it. It's a game. They're like, oh, yeah, did you see this? Blah, blah, blah. And it was like, awesome. We made this huge game out of it. It was super fun. Um, you can play on a capture the flag, for instance, and people finding flags, awesome reason to celebrate. Like, there's anything that doesn't go wrong. <laughs> yes. Sometimes it's hard to see when you're doing right. It's hard for management to know why they give you money. Um, and uh, it's really nice if you can figure out ways to show your value. Other ways are, for instance, like Defect Dojo or in Azure, they have like the security score where they have all of these things that they measure you against. And they're like, you should fix these things. And if you do fix them, it gives you points. So you can actually see your score just go up and up and up. And you can show management, like, we went up 75 points this month. Right? And then, again, it's like an excuse to celebrate, but those celebrations show management you're doing a good job. They help increase morale. I find that InfoSec can be very kind of pessimistic sometimes. Like when I was in software development, I didn't feel that in a way that sometimes I feel like there's this impending doom feeling or like helplessness feeling sometimes from some AppSec professionals. And um, I want to be the opposite of that when I talk to dev and ops and other security professionals. Like we can do this. We can. Does that help? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I don't want to steal the next speaker's time because oh, that's no, rude. We still got time for. We still have time. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. I thought I, I thought I went over. Do we have any more questions? <laughs> yeah. Are there any oh. other questions? Oh, Hi. Up there. Do you want a microphone? Hey. Hey, Tanya. Thank you. All right. I'll go first. Thanks, Tanya, for a non-boring security oh, thank you. keynote. Um, I'm Dan Argao from realestate.com.au. I'm definitely not security. Um, but I do hear security people often complaining that it takes a god-awful long time to get things done, and they feel like they have to beg and beg and get upset and find ways for things to get done. It's great when things are you know, quick and everything gets fixed, but often it isn't. Mm -hmm. And then in the end, people go like, oh, it took a year to get this resolved. And it eventually does get resolved. My question is, do you still celebrate, even though it took a year and you went through hell to get something done? Do you still buy donuts in situations like that? I feel or? like you buy wine. <laughs> but... <laughs> Maybe you should like celebrate that you fought management and lived. Um, I think it depends on you and how you feel about it, right? Because like you did win, and gosh, you fought a giant battle to get there. I find in situations like that, so a lot of people ask me. I remember the first AppSec conference I went to. Um, you know, I was just like starring in security, and I'm like really excited. I'm like, okay, so I'm this new pen tester, and sometimes I find things that are wrong, and they're like. Oh, Tanya, go away overreacting, <laughs> which no one likes. And um, I'm like, how do you get them to do the thing? And the guy I was talking to is um, on the OWASP board. His name's Owen, and he's like all muscly and stuff. He's like, I just flex my abs like muscle at them. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> okay, so I'm not a gigantic, huge man with like 500 muscles. So <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> um, and so I discovered like showing them. So first, starting with sugar and honey and being like really friendly, like, hey, security headers are your friends. It's like a seatbelt for AppSec. It's just in case something goes bad. It's one line of code. I'll show you how. But then if they don't, then I would do like a lunch and learn about the date and how I'm worried. And then if they still don't, then either one, I create like a proof of concept. And then um, 
So like one size, so like security headers for some reason, like no one wants to use them. They're so important. They're so worth it. It's like one line of code. It's nothing. And okay, vent a uh, rant over. But um, so what I did was is I sent an email to like the security people that were, so security people blocking me from adding the security header. They're like, oh, the developers won't like it. So you're not even allowed bringing it up. And so I was like, you've won a free iPod. Click on this link. And they're like, Tanya, we know this is from you. Like, I know. But I, I know we have 20,000 employees. Someone's going to click on it. So they click on it, and it's like I'm framing their website, and then I'm stealing their credentials. And they're like, wow, that looks just like prod. I'm like, that is prod. That took me like 45 minutes, if that, and I was answering emails at the same time. It's really easy. And they're like, oh. And then one of the guys is like, well, it's bright yellow. Like, anyone would notice them. Like, you tell me it's bright yellow so that you can see it. That's the part that took so long. It's like one minute to make the code. And I'm like, how do I make it so they can see it? I was like scratching my head. Like, I'm like, how do I show I'm doing this thing to them? I'm like, oh, I'll make it like this bright color. And they're just like, holy shit. Uh, and then all of a sudden, they're like, how do we do these header things? I'm like, oh, you just, you just do this, and we just do that. And all of a sudden, everyone was on board. But you can't do that all the time, because when you don't have enough time to, like, you shouldn't pee in people's cornflakes, as the expression goes, right? Um, another time I was working somewhere, and management would not get on board, so I created a risk sign-off sheet, which totally does not exist, but they didn't know that. And I just explained, like, oh, we did these pen tests, we found all these results. I'm like, so we're not doing this, and that could result in, and then I like described very graphically like business things that could happen that were very scary for me and for them. And then I was like, if you could just sign off that this is acceptable to you... And then the departmental security officer called me. His name was Bill. Bill's such a badass. And he's like, what is this shit, Tanya? I'm not signing this crap. And I, I was like, well, Bill, everyone's telling me that they don't have time to fix any of these things. And it's not important. He's like, you tell them Bill sent you. So I go in the meeting. I'm like, hi, everyone. I'm like, I want it. And they're like, we don't have time for that. I'm like, well, Bill said. And they're like, oh, well, oh, oh, Bill said. OK, well, we'll just go do it. And the irony is like, I'm like a foot taller than Bill. <laughs> And, like, I, I'm literally, like, a bigger person than he is. And they're just like, oh, damn, Bill, but he's a badass. Like, I, mean, I don't know if that is a word you would use to describe me. But that's okay. Um, but do you celebrate, like, if you've had this awful long battle? I don't know. I, I, I celebrate lots of things. Like, when it's my birthday, I celebrate at least seven days. So, like, I like celebrations. <laughs> but it's up to you. <laughs> I have no idea if that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay, I think it's break time. Yeah, Everyone go thank- get more coffee. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.